Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. This week could help give nearly 700,000 dreamers the protection they've been seeking as legal residents or U.S. citizens. The United States House has voted to approve the American Dream and Opportunity Act. It will now go to the U.S. Senate for a vote. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals still has hurdles to overcome in the courts as well. Jesse DeGoyado reintroduces us to a young woman brought here illegally as a child who was in the room where lawmakers are taking up DACA yet again. Teacher Maria Rocha Carrillo was back in her sixth grade classroom soon after she'd represented dreamers like herself as Congressman Joaquin Castro's guest at the State of the Union, the one where President Trump didn't shake the hand of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who then tore up the speech he made. His presidency ended with the fate of deferred action for childhood arrivals still uncertain. Which is not okay because, you know, human lives are being played with. There were going through emotional, mental trauma, and this is not the country that we, we strive to be. Nearly a decade after she was given DACA status, the U.S. Senate will soon vote on the New American Dream and Promise Act, offering an eight-year path to citizenship with certain conditions. I hope they, they vote for what's, what's right for humanity. In a bipartisan way, she says, but the emergency on the southern border could make it harder to get Republican support, even though many of the new arrivals are asylum seekers. This is our home, and we're not escaping anything because this is our home, and we've established ourselves in this ourselves in this country. The UTSA grad and dual language teacher says if the latest DREAM Act is defeated, then we'll continue to wait. We'll continue to wait and, and make noise and not let this issue get swept under the rug as it as it usually always does. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The Bear County District Attorney and other local officials say they are standing with the Asian community. In a press conference outside the county courthouse this afternoon, attended by members of several Asian American and community groups, D.A. Joe Gonzalez says it is important to denounce the kind of hatred seen across the country. Our Garrett Berger joins us live covering this one for us today. And Garrett, did the D.A. say what exactly prompted this conference today? Well, the DA did make reference to the mass shooting in Atlanta in which most of the victims were of Asian descent. But of course, hanging over this is an incident closer to home. Just this past weekend, Noodle Tree, a northwest side ramen restaurant, was covered and vandalized by racist and anti-mask graffiti. Now, P Police Chief William McManus was at this press conference and called the vandal a, quote, bigoted coward. And while the district attorney said he couldn't comment on the specifics of the case, he did promise that any crime they could identify as a hate crime would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, with his office seeking jail or prison time. District 8 Councilman Manny Palaya said the issue wasn't just about one restaurant. It's about the entire Asian American community being scared. But... The beautiful thing about San Antonio is that you guys know we have your back, right? You guys know that your district attorney has your back. You guys know that your mayor and you guys know that your chief of police and your sheriff have your back. And that's because we love you. Which the president of the Asian American Council said the U.S. is their home, telling those watching we don't have to prove it every time that we're American, too. The D.A. urged anyone with knowledge of any kind of anti-Asian crime to report it to law enforcement. Live at the Bear County Courthouse, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. The San Antonio City Council gave CPS Energy the go-ahead today to borrow up to $500 million dollars through short-term financing should the utility need it to deal with the enormous costs related to last month's power crisis, the mass power outages. CPS Energy says it's facing charges of $1 billion for the power and natural gas it purchased during the February winter event when prices for both skyrocketed. However, the utility, which has already sued the state's power grid, managed over the energy, managed over the energy prices, says it plans to challenge any unlawful, unconscionable, or illegitimate costs. And as I've mentioned, we're only going to pay, even though we're estimating the maximum cost of a billion dollars, we're only going to be looking to pay what we consider to be the legitimate and justified costs. Little discussion of how this would eventually affect CPS customers, however, but the utility has talked in the past about possibly spreading the cost out over a decade or more. 
San Antonio City Council passing a resolution today supporting gender pay parity with references to pay disparities between men and women and the effect the pandemic has had on female workers in particular. The resolution states the city supports initiatives to close the wage gap in our community. It also mentions steps that different city departments will take to achieve that goal. The city of San Antonio also announcing today that they are working to help residents, including the homeless, get their third stimulus checks. By now, millions have received their $1,400 checks. The Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program will assist residents with completing and filing their federal taxes. Staff will be on site at the DHS Homeless Resource Hub at San Fernando Gym off of West Travis Street every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 in the afternoon until 4 p.m. A vehicle seen driving the wrong way gets involved in a crash where BCSO deputies discovered the driver was only 13 years old. It's a story we had last night on the night beat. This happening on Highway 16 in South Bear County near the Atascosa County line. A deputy chased the vehicle, which ended when another vehicle was hit. No one was badly hurt. It's unclear if that teenager was taken into custody. A, a man is dead after police say he was run over by a city vehicle on the southeast side this morning. This happened just before 10 a.m. at the intersection of Southeast Military Drive and Goliad. The city employee was at that location to check a gauge and clear a water drainage area. When that employee drove off, he ran over the victim. The victim was pronounced dead there at the scene. The Bear County Medical Examiner has not yet identified that person. Police did rule this an accident and no charges are expected. For the first time in a year, inmates in Texas prisons are being allowed to have in-person visits. They were banned when the pandemic hit last spring. Paul Venomo with the reaction to the new policy from an inmate's wife and her surprising message to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. This announcement on the Texas Department of Criminal Justice website was an answered prayer for Daisy Busby. It blew my mind. I was completely surprised, but I'm so grateful that they were able to do it. The it she's talking about is removing the ban on in-person visits in the Texas prison system. The visits were halted a year ago when the pandemic hit. Busby's husband has been here at the Dominguez State Jail for 18 months for a parole violation. For her and the couple's children, the ban has made things tough. It's been a struggle. You know, there's no words to describe how difficult this has been. Are you apprehensive? Are you tell, tell me your feelings as you as, as you anticipate this visit? There's definitely anxiety. Um, my first reaction when you asked that question was, I'm, I'm looking forward to see his smiling face, but I'm not going to get to see his smiling face <laughs> because he's going to be wearing a mask. Busby gives the prison system high marks for giving her something to cling to as she waits for her visit. TDCJ has done a remarkable job turning around this visitation opportunity. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. VIA is celebrating its operators with cheers and waves today on Transit Driver Appreciation Day. VIA board members and executives stood outside two of the busiest transit centers with signs showing their support. Leaders of the transit agency said they want their employees to feel appreciated, especially during this pandemic. Being frontline essential employees for this community and getting people to where they need to be every day is something that we never want to take for granted. Since last March, more than 1,200 bus and van operators have continued to keep VIA services running for the community. If you're looking for a job, then listen up because the Brooks Virtual Job Fair is happening next Wednesday. Oaken Business Processes is looking to hire up to 100 more employees from San Antonio. We spoke to one of their employees to understand what it's like to look for a job during a pandemic. That's the most horrible feeling, wondering if you're going to be able to pay for the little groceries that you can find. It's a blessing to have been given this opportunity in the middle of the pandemic. For more details on how to be a part of the virtual job fair, head to KSAT.com. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. 74 degrees out there, plenty of sunshine, low humidity. It's been a beautiful spring day, Adam. And look at how crisp that sky is. Nice baby blue sky. This time yesterday we had that dust. Movement. I was going to say much better than last night yes. where it was kind of some haze on oh. the street lights. It was kind of weird. It was it was kind of eerie, wasn't yeah. it? Right at sunset and you can Thank our friends in Lubbock, San, San Angelo, Midland for that uh, dust that swept into town yesterday at this time. It's out of here now. 
49 was our morning low with a high of 75, pretty much average for this time of year, pretty much on par. Take a look at our pollen count though. Mold is low, hackberry and oak registering, they're on the low end, but oak is just about to spike. You can see the buds on the trees, we're almost there, so get ready for that, especially if you're sensitive to the oak. Still a little breezy, wind gust recently at the airport up to 33 miles per hour, even New Braunfels gusting to 26, but the wind's gonna subside as we go through the evening and night, so nothing to really worry about or think about in terms of the high winds that we've been experiencing. 60s and 70s now, 60s hill country, 70s elsewhere, almost 80 in Catula, now it's 79. 73 in San Antonio and Hondo currently at 76. You get up into Bernie area, 68 along with Canyon Lake. As we go through the evening, temperatures falling off quickly. Clear sky, calmer wind, dry air, good radiational cooling. So we'll be down in the 50s by 10 p.m. And tomorrow morning, starting our day, closer to 40 degrees. And in the hill country, I think we'll have some mid to upper 30s. So a chill in the, in the air to start the day tomorrow. By the afternoon, more of the same, sunny, low humidity right near 70. We'll take a look at the latest drought monitor and our rain chances coming right up. I'm Mayor Ron Nuremberg, joined tonight by Dr. Ruth Bergren, who is the uh, COVID liaison for Nelson, uh, Judge Nelson Wolf. We're also joined by Dr. Jim DeWu, who is our local public health authority and medical director for San Antonio Metro Health. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 77 new cases of COVID-19, which brings a total to 201,273. Please note that there was a delay in receiving results from the curative labs, so this number appears a little bit lower than uh, it really is, and we should have a correction over the next few days as those curative lab results come in to our community. Uh, our seven-day rolling average, again, which is an accurate picture of how this pa pandemic is progressing, is 146. Fortunately, there are no new deaths to report tonight, uh, but as you know, we have lost many of our loved ones and neighbors, so please keep their survivors and families in your prayers this evening. There are 202 patients in our local hospitals tonight. That's down six from yesterday. Over the last 24 hours, there were 37 new admissions. 79 patients are in the ICU and 41 are on ventilators. And again, those numbers are trending in the right direction. The hospitals, again, being uh, an ultimate picture of how this pandemic has progressed over the last several months in the community. And that is um, going in the right direction, but the fight against COVID-19 is not over. So please wear your mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands, and get vaccinated when it's your turn. As of yesterday, 387,892 people in our community have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and 215,467 people are now fully vaccinated in Bear County. Those are very good numbers, uh, but clearly we have a ways to go, so that's why it's so important for us to continue to do our part. Uh, to slow down the spread of the virus. Metro Health would like to announce that people who are scheduled for the COVID-19 vaccine at the Alamo Dome on April 2nd will be rescheduled to April 5th at the same time. Again, those who had vaccine appointments at the Alamo Dome scheduled for April 2nd, your new date is gonna be April 5th at the same time. We appreciate your patience and thank you for understanding. Let me turn it now to Dr. Uh, Bergren for a county perspective. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here with you. Um, I can't overemphasize the comment you made about asking people to continue to be vigilant. I just was on the wards at University Hospital today, down in the emergency room, admitting new patients. Fewer than we have been admitting, but each person who comes in has a story, and some of them are very sick. Um, these numbers regarding vaccination are so encouraging, and I just want to highlight that a little bit. You know, if you add to those numbers, um, the, the one, nearly 100,000 that will have been vaccinated or doses administered at UT Health uh, by the end of the week, we're going to be looking at nearly half a million people in Bear County, or half a million doses of, of vaccine that have been given. And globally, around the world, more than 360 million doses have been administered. So for everybody who is saying, you know, I want to wait until a few people get vaccinated before I get my vaccine, I have good news for you. More than 360 million people on planet Earth have gotten these vaccines, and we haven't seen any new concerning safety signals. In fact, we're only getting good news. Um, this Earlier this month, Pfizer announced uh, from data out of Israel 
that not only was the vaccine 97 percent effective in preventing symptomatic disease, it was 94 percent effective in preventing asymptomatic disease, which means that these vaccines are drastically reducing the possibility that people will go about shedding virus asymptomatically. So uh, we're making true progress uh, on our exit ramp of this pandemic. I would like to also highlight that people can get vaccinated at UT Health. Initially, we were vaccinating our campus, our healthcare workers, and our patients, and we are now extending that to appropriate tiers of the general public. If you were to go to our website at this moment, you'd find out that we are booked for the next two weeks. However, on Monday, we should have a functionality that will permit you to register yourself and you will get contacted when it's possible for you to get a vaccine appointment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Bergeron. And together with Dr. Wu, uh, both of you have been uh, representing a great many thousands of people who have been working on the front lines of this pandemic. So from all of us to uh, the folks that you work with on a daily basis, thank you very much to our medical professionals for keeping us safe and leading us in the right direction here as we try to get this pandemic behind us, which we do again have a ways to go. But we do want to remind you that if you're struggling through this pandemic, paying rent or mortgage, there is a assistance available for you. You can call 311 or go to covid19.sanantonio.gov to access. All right, low numbers again, although there may be a lag time in some of the reporting uh, from some of the testing sites, just 77 new cases, no new deaths, which is very good news. Also, you heard the mayor say uh, 387,892 people right now have been vaccinated for one dose. 215,467 people have been fully vaccinated at this point. It's great, but there's still a lot of work to do. And to kind of give you a, a broader picture, maybe a benchmark people can grasp a little bit better, Dr. Ruth Bergren, somebody we're very familiar with, who we'll actually be talking to in a few more minutes in this newscast, said all those numbers plus the 100,000 doses given out at UT Health yep. by the end of the week, that means roughly half a million people, half a million doses rather, will have been administered in Bear County uh, to date. So she's saying that's really encouraging news for this vaccination effort. There's there's also something she brought up that I want to talk to her about when we have her on live here in a few minutes. She talked about UT Health San Antonio signing up people to get the vaccine that they're going to have. You know, there's been a lot of talk about waiting lists in San Antonio. Kind of sounded like she said they have one like you can register on there and they will tell you when a vaccination is available. I want to make sure I understood that right. So uh, again, we're going to have her on our case at Q&A coming up in a few minutes. Ask Dr. Ruth Berger that question. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's turn to the forecast out there right now. It's a beautiful day. Of course, we want this to stick around a while, Adam. Well, you know, if only we could have a few of these days sprinkled in, say, July, <laughs> yeah. right? August. Yeah. I wouldn't complain. No, n none of us would. I've actually, okay, since we're on the topic, or maybe we're not, but it comes to mind. <laughs> We've here been we here go. before. I've always thought how cool it would be if in the summertime we'd have big rainstorms. You know, instead of rain, it would just snow on you. Wouldn't that be great in the middle of summer, just in August? Snow in your flip-flops? Yeah. Uh, this is just what I think about when I'm driving down the road and I have spare time. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fascinating? So it's not just thermometers that you daydream about? No, here. not only thermometers. It's other forms yeah, of weather. Other, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, and you, my wife, too, right, Pam? Yes, of course. Yes, yes, that's that's the other. <laughs> of course. All right, temperatures right now, 60s and 70s. You look across the state, gets a little cooler in the panhandle. Look at Amarillo at 49. I want to show you the visible satellite imagery because that little white area up there, Amarillo and northeastward into Oklahoma, that's snow from yesterday's snowfall. It was on the ground this morning. You could see it very distinctly around 9 10 a.m. from the visible satellite imagery then it really melted off and it's pretty much gone now with the warmer temperatures all the action from that system is moving east of the mississippi new england mid-atlantic southeastern states they're getting the good moisture it would be nice to have that kind of rainfall that kind of radar signature over south texas but unfortunately we just don't have it in the works right now our next system is in the Pacific Northwest. It's coming on shore right now. It's causing some rain up and down the West Coast, and that's not going to make it here until Monday night, and with it, just some scattered activity expected. This evening, temperatures falling off quickly, down in the 50s by 10 o'clock. Tomorrow morning, starting the day at 42, and in the Hill Country, I think we'll have some mid to upper 30s. So a chill in the air early, then sunny, and right near 70 by the afternoon. 
bright sunshine, low humidity and north wind at only 5 to 15. Temperatures, they remain pretty much the same all the way through the weekend. Cool mornings, comfortable afternoons, low humidity. And then we get into Monday night, and that's when our, we have that chance of a few scattered showers. So cross your fingers for that. We'll look at the newest drought monitor, by the way, next half hour. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. So the, we're less than a week away from the trading deadline. So are the Spurs shoppers or sellers? We are hearing that they're trying to shop LaMarcus, which I think we already knew about. Well, Rudy Gay is reportedly on the trading block as well. Uh, and according to reports, an East Coast team is really interested in the two of them, particularly Gay. And two Southside football greats say they will miss their shorts competition. I'll explain coming up. up the defense and turned a 23-point hole into a 7-point win, 106-99 at Chicago last night. The silver and black went to a full-court press early in the second half, and that caused the Bulls a lot of problems. 11 second-half turnovers leading to 11 points for the Spurs. Plus, in the second half, the Spurs used a 15-0 run, followed by a 17-0 run to fuel their comeback. Kelvin Johnson was asked what turned this game around for them. Defense. I feel like our defense intensity picked up, and, um, I mean, we just kept playing together, you know, and uh, we just called our way back in the game. We just kept chipping away, chipping away one stop at a time. We played two great defensive quarters in the second half, uh, spurred on by uh, Patty Mills' aggressiveness, and it just seemed to infect everybody else. Uh, offensively, we made a few shots, which we did not do in the first half, and, you know, Jakob had a, a wonderful game. Cavs will host the Spurs tomorrow night at 6.30. DeMar is out again for personal reasons. It's being reported by the Miami Herald that trade talks between the Heat and Spurs for LaMarcus Aldridge really amounted to nothing. They say trade conversations involving Spurs and LaMarcus Aldridge went nowhere. In addition, the Spurs are looking to trade Rudy Gay to the Heat, but the Spurs wanted more in return than Miami is willing to give up. The report says the Heat jumped uh, moved on from that because of the inability to agree on trade compensation for San Antonio's Rudy Gay. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans star quarterback Deshaun Watson is now accused of sexual assault in a third civil lawsuit. The lawsuit was filed by Houston attorney Tony Busby on Wednesday night. This is the third female masseuse to file a civil case against Watson this week. Busby, who is representing the three women who have filed sexual misconduct lawsuits against Watson, says the total number of accusers has ballooned to nine and says he will file the remaining ones in due course. Busby also posted a letter from the NFL today that reveals the league is investigating the allegations against Watson. The letter was tagged as confidential and Busby deleted the photo from Instagram about 30 minutes after he posted it. Running back Malcolm Brown was all smiles today, signing his new contract with the Miami Dolphins. We're told he was scheduled to sign in here in town, but at the last minute, the Dolphins asked him to fly to Miami to finish the deal. Brown tweeted, we official now. Let's get it, Miami. Yesterday, we stopped by Southside High School to chat with Richard Torres and Caleb Camarillo. Richard is a pro-style QB whose stock is rising headed into his senior season, while Caleb is a great athlete who signed with the Air Force Academy. Richard and Caleb were a dynamic duo for Southside, so we asked, what will they miss about playing football with each other? Me scrambling around and then just Launching it down field and Caleb going to get it. <laughs> Definitely that. <laughs> what are you going to miss about not playing with him? Probably seeing who can wear the shorter shorts at practice. Me and Rich, you always have a competition to see who can wear the shorts and shorts at practice. Seriously, that's funny. The shortest shorts? The yeah. shortest shorts. <laughs> they, that come about? I don't even remember. It I, mean, was, I think it was uh, seven on seven is where it started because. We, I would always wear the above the knee shorts and then Richie would come out of nowhere and he'll have like four inches above the knee and I'm just like, all right, Richie, we're going. And then we just kept going back and, and the next thing you know, our, half of our girdles hanging out of our shorts because they're just messing around. Right, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> that is funny. Spree, I'm not going to do that conversation. Yeah, I don't think you. we should do no. that one. Thank you no. to both yeah. of you. For Myra's <laughs> sake. To that, I appreciate For Myra's it. sake, we should not do <laughs> a shorts yeah, competition. Casky wants to do it. Of course, Casky's in. <laughs> It's just a solo competition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he doesn't care. <laughs> we'll be right back.
The 21 year old suspect in the massage parlor shootings near Atlanta not facing a judge today as originally scheduled. No reason was given for his first appearance in court now being canceled. ABC's Elwin Lopez with that story. Mourners turning out at vigils overnight to remember the victims of Tuesday's deadly shooting rampage. Authorities say 21 year old Robert Aaron Long is accused of murdering eight people in three separate shootings at spas across Metro Atlanta. Some guy came in and shot the gun, so everybody heard the gunshot. Six of the victims were Asian women. Long, a white man, told investigators he did not have a racial motive, but police said it was too early to exclude that possibility. We need to make sure we have any Asian spies. We need to be checking on them. Officials noted these attacks come amid a wave of anti-Asian crimes. We are not about to get into victim blaming victim shaming here. Authorities say Long had previously been a customer of those businesses. He apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex fiction. It was Long's family who helped police after identifying him in these surveillance pictures. We were contacted by uh, members of the family uh, <laughs> indicating that that may be their, their uh, son. Investigators say they eventually caught up with him south of Atlanta by tracking his cell phone. They believe he was planning to continue his killing spree in Florida. Atlanta police are in the early stages of the investigation, and as of now, they're not ruling out hatred as a motive for these shootings. This, as Asian American advocates and lawmakers are set to testify before Congress today, including actor Daniel Day Kim, on the rise in hatred in the Asian Americans and Pacific Islander community. Elwin Lopez, ABC News, Atlanta. It is Thursday. She was just on the city county briefing. Now she joins us for KSAT Q&A. As always, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergen from UT Health San Antonio and the Long School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you for joining us. There's something you talked about in the briefing that I think is going to hit a lot of people that they're going to pay attention to. And that is, for lack of a better word, a waiting list that UT Health has right now for people who want to get vaccinated. Can you explain that to me? Am I, am I understanding it right? Um, well, Close. Uh, we do have a website that is now something the general public can access. It's pretty user friendly. Uh, you'll be able to click, just go to the UT Health's website and search for vaccine. And there is a page that comes up that's very self explanatory. If you go there right now, you will find out that we are booked out for two weeks. However, beginning on Monday, there will be a way that you can enter your information. You register yourself with all of your um, demographic information, your age, et cetera, and your mobile phone number. And somebody will then contact you one way or another when slots open up. That's how it is supposed to work. So don't expect to be able to register right now or get an appointment today, but we understand that this functionality will be available on Monday. I think a lot of people will appreciate having that. I want to talk about uh, something that was discussed earlier on in the vaccine effort, whether the vaccines not only prevent someone from getting seriously ill with COVID-19, but from also spreading COVID-19. What do we know about the vaccine function? So some new data were released earlier this month by Pfizer. They looked at uh, information from Israel, from uh, de-identified uh, data, and they confirmed again that the vaccine is 97% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID, but the added news is that it was 94% effective in preventing asymptomatic COVID. That means that if you got the vaccine, there's 94% chance that you will not get asymptomatic disease that results in you walking around and spreading COVID unwittingly. So this is a hugely important piece of information that uh, tells us that this uh, vaccine is going to work to help us end the pandemic. These vaccines will do so. What, what uh, you know, there's a lot of myths out there and rumors out there. And one of the things I like to do is separate the fact from the fiction. Do COVID-19 vaccines contain aborted fetal cells? Categorically, no. The vaccines do not contain any aborted fetal cells and they do not contain fetal tissue. 
The confusion has come from the fact that some of the vaccines have used cell lines that were derived from fetuses decades ago, many generations of cell lines later. These cell lines in a test tube uh, were used to help understand if the vaccine would work. Would these lipid nanoparticles or these adenovirus vectors get into human cells? In the case of the J&J, &J, a human cell line that was derived from fetus is used to produce the vaccine, but there are no fetal cells and no fetal tissue in the vaccines. A viewer named Annette wrote into us and said that she was concerned about the Bell's palsy risk and getting the vaccine, and she is not alone. It's something that I've done a yeah. lot of reading about over the last several months, given my own history with Bell's palsy. So what can you tell us about that risk? So I went and crunched some numbers, especially for you, Myra. Thank um, you. <laughs> I have good news for you. So um, it's true that cases of Bell's palsy were reported both in the Moderna and in the Pfizer um, vaccine trials. And there was some concern because it seemed like there were more Bell's palsy cases, a few more in the vaccinated than in the placebo. However, if you look at um, in the world, how many people get Bell's palsy in a given year, um, that number is about 23 to 35 per 100,000 people in, in a year will get Bell's palsy. The incidence of Bell's palsy in the vaccinated population was lower than what it is in just the normal population. So there's absolutely no evidence. But because there was an imbalance, more cases in the vaccinated than the placebo, both the FDA and the CDC said in December that they were going to keep a close tab on this, close watch and monitor for the outcomes. But there's been no signal since then with all the many millions of vaccines that have been given that there are higher rates of Bell's palsy. So that's the numbers that I crunched just for you. Thank very you. Good. Thank you very much. And, and one of the things you talked about in the briefing was the fact that, you know, this is not an unknown anymore. We know how people are reacting to this vaccine. That kind of also leads with this question. Are people dying of the vaccine? And what do you say to people who say, I just want to wait a little bit until I'm sure it's safe? Right. So there's absolutely no evidence that people are dying of the vaccine. Of course, if you give out 360 million vaccines in the world, you're going to see some vaccinated people die because people die. People who are going to die of a stroke or a heart attack, they will die of a stroke or a heart attack whether they got the vaccine or not. Our minds tend to want to make a link with that. But we're watching these numbers closely and there's no evidence that the vaccine is causing people to die more rapidly. And what was the second part? Just what, what do you say to someone who says, I want to wait until I'm sure this is safe? Well, uh, good news for you. We've had more than 360 million people on planet Earth. And by the end of this week, we'll have close to half a million doses that have been delivered right here in Bear County. So odds are, you know, a lot of people that have been vaccinated and certainly in the world, hundreds of millions, not just millions, hundreds of millions of people have gotten the vaccine. And the same safety data that we were presented with at the outset are consistent with what we're seeing now in terms of effects of the vaccine. Few vaccines given out at this point, I would say. Thanks yeah. so much for your time, as always, answering those big questions and that burning one that I've been wanting to ask you for weeks. So thank you very num much for the number crunching. Most welcome. Dr. Ruth Bergen, as always, thanks. We'll be right back. I know we need the rain, but it's hard to beat a day like today. Yeah, absolutely. And it's Thermometer Thursday. That's right, it is. <laughs> I just actually talked to the winner of this homemade thermometer, gave her a call, and it was fun uh, chatting with her. We're going to reveal that in a moment and talk about a uh, special month that it is and how a homemade thermometer relates to it. So we'll get to that in a moment. First of all, our headlines, not as windy out there. That's what's nice. Low humidity as well. Rain chances, they come next week, but unfortunately, we're not looking at a whole big rainy pattern. We're just looking at a little chance uh, early next week. So we'll get to that in a moment. First of all, our winds still a little breezy out there at times. We did clock a gust up to 33 miles per hour recently here in San Antonio and New Braunfels even gusting to 26. So yeah, it's noticeable, but it's not as bad as what we had yesterday and it's going to continue to subside and pump the brakes 
through the evening and night. That north wind though still blowing in that dry air. Dew points down in the 20s, so very dry air in place. And we're not going to see much of a really uptick in the humidity anytime soon. I mean, by Monday we'll see some deweys in the 50s. But that's it. It's really just going to give us some morning clouds on Sunday and some clouds on Monday, but we're not looking at anything that's really going to feel that sticky and humid outside. So no big changes to the humidity, at least not that's going to be very noticeable. Quiet across the state today, yesterday, and even well, the night before we had some active weather, but now the active weather is all far east of us, especially east of the Mississippi River. I wish we could take some of that rain and just pull it our way, but unfortunately we can't do that. That upper system is moving away from us. The next system that's moving toward us is over the Pacific. That's moving into the Pacific Northwest right now. It's dumping some rain from Seattle all the way down to south of San Francisco. And as it moves our way, it gives us a little hope for rain the early part of next week. That would be Monday night. Otherwise, we're looking dry and actually very sunny as well, which will continue to dry us out. Here's the latest drought monitor. Almost 70% of Texas is considered in drought, so we really need our spring rains to come and to join us and relieve, of, relieve us of this drought, especially West Texas and South Texas, the valley, even here into San Antonio. Catula, in that extreme range, you get to Laredo, actually in the exceptional category, which is the worst category. Even Bear County, though, you look at the northern half of the county and we're considered in severe drought. So not a good situation. Again, Monday night, we have hope for some scattered rain, but nothing that would be drought busting. 60s and 70s now. 64 in Rock Springs and Fredericksburg, 70s elsewhere. Catula almost 80 degrees at 79 and Pleasanton 76. This evening, temperatures falling down pretty quickly as that sun sets with this dry air and the calmer wind and lack of cloud cover. Good radiational cooling, so temperatures fall off nicely. 10 o'clock will be down in the 50s, and then tomorrow morning you'll actually notice a bit of a chill in the air. We're talking near 40 degrees, so I anticipate some mid 30s in parts of the hill country tomorrow morning. The rest of us closer to 40 degrees, so a sweatshirt or light jacket at the bus stop in the morning by the afternoon, sunny, comfortable, pleasant. We're looking at an afternoon high right near 70 degrees. Then we get into the weekend. No big changes temperature wise. Mornings a little on the cool side, but close to average for this time of year. Low to mid 40s. And then by the afternoons we will still be in the lower 70s and comfortable. We get into Monday. You'll notice the clouds in the sky. Fairly gray day. And unfortunately, those clouds aren't going to drop much until we have the chance of rain into Monday night, early Tuesday morning. Right now we got a 40% chance of some scattered activity. Stephen Myra, you know, you know my disdain for the national days. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm sure we have one coming up later in this newscast. <laughs> Perhaps. I like national months, though. Oh, oh okay. why? March is National Kidney Month, actually. Oh, okay. And All take right. a look at this. I want to introduce you to Anna Zolta. Okay, she's a re recipient of not just a kidney, but also a pancreas, and she celebrated a very important anniversary on St. Patrick's Day. 30 years as a recipient of the two organs. Wow. Very, very That's big great. deal. So Amazing. March National Kidney Month, raise awareness about kidney disease and of course in regards to organ donation and the critical need for the life-saving donors. So her friend actually reached out to me hoping we could get some kind of special gift for her because they celebrate every year on St. Patrick's Day. So I met him at Cracker Barrel and brought him, <laughs> a, uh, brought him a homemade thermometer. It's got the Donate Life uh, logo on there. And you know, you know what Anna says is today I celebrate another blessed St. Patrick, Patty's Day in 30 years with my kidney and pancreas. I'm thankful every day for our brave young man who became my heroic donor and provided the second chance for life. That is awesome. Oh, that's an yes. amazing yeah. So I like to try to you know, that special gift. I like that I can do that and help out. Yep. Today's winner, Karen Crummel of San Antonio. Yeah, you, Karen, the one I just talked to a couple minutes ago. By the way, I also noticed that you didn't seem unhappy to be a Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Recognize the How could you ever? Yeah. Right? Seem unhappy to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Smelled like bacon right yeah, when I pulled that's in. what I'm saying. Oh, the <laughs> apples? Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, okay, we have to go to break. We'll be right yeah. back. <laughs> In the buzz, YouTube's answer to TikTok is coming. They're calling it Shorts. YouTube's phone app 
has many of the same features as TikTok. It's aimed at social media creators. It's been around for some time in India where YouTube has been beta testing the software. The short form video creation tool now starting to roll out in the US. It joins a crowd of a field cr crowded field rather of competitors trying to chip away at TikTok's market share. Instagram has Reels, Snapchat has Spotlight and Reddit owns Dub Smash. They're all trying to target the next generation of influencers and become popular with the young users. Who isn't? <laughs> All right, this next story is an education for me. Non-fungible tokens or NFTs are the latest rage in the crypto world. Even Charmin getting in on the trend. NFTs are digital artworks and collectibles that have been transformed into verifiable assets. Charmin has five pieces of digital art up for bidding. They're calling them NFTPs, as in non-fungible toilet paper. Ah. Right now, bids range from 500 to 2100 real dollars. Most of the money from the sale will go to Direct Relief, a humanitarian aid nonprofit. By the way, that's the effect they're going for. It's not something wrong with your TV. Ah. Just letting you know. And now we know. We'll be right back. That is all our time. Thanks so much for watching the news at 6. We'll see you right back here on the Night Beat at 10. And a lot of talk about non-fungible. Did you know what that means? No. Nope. Like I said, it was a bit of education. Yeah. Show. Non-fungible. We're, we're learning together. It's non-fungible TP.